Welcome everyone. This is the first lesson of the Effects Masters program. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here we are. Uh, let's go right away. Please, if you haven't seen the, the previous video, uh, the introduction video, just to get how everything works, uh, please watch it and then jump in here. So we don't need to see that. Uh, this is going to be, this is the FTP. I'm using Fetch on the Mac. Those of you who use Mac, you can use FileZilla. Try to use FileZilla. If you're a Mac, use Fetch. It works for me. I created a folder called the Effects Power User Program 2017. In here, I'll be posting the scene files that you will need. Right now, it's empty because we haven't even started. So just wanted to show you that. That out of the way. First lesson. Um, let's start talking about particles right away. Let's jump in. On the, the Effects Power User Program, we're going to have to come up with a name. So I'm going to call it the Effects Power User Program 2013 or the 2013 version. Okay, let's just to keep it simple to differentiate between this one, the 2017 and the 2013 version. All right, let's just do it that way. So in the 2013 version, um, I go step by step, attribute per attribute. I, I jump and skip over the boring stuff. But I have a very detailed explanation of everything, so it takes uh, you know a bit more time um, to cover more of the basic topics. On this new version, uh, I'm assuming that you have access, like I said before, to that course. So if you want to go a bit slower first, go and refer to those things. It will be the exact same thing. I want to show it to you. I'm going to prove it to you right now that the the effects are done the exact same way on both versions of Maya. Um, but I want to jump right away with, with the new examples and new ways of, uh, you know, coming up with ideas. So, you know, last night, um, as you might have seen from my promotion and all, I prepared, you know, a couple of things like this. Like I did on the other course, the disclaimer. Um, I'm not going to focus on rendering. This is a simulations course. I want you guys to get very, very proficient and very effective and dangerous doing particle simulations and fluids and rigid bodies and all those kind of things. All right, leave the rendering to the lighting guys, to the, the pretty nicely detailed, uh, I hate the word uh, AOVs and secondary displays and all that. I, that's not the job of an effects TD. It is not, it is not in, in big productions. So if you want to work as a freelancer in small little things, then you're going to have to learn everything. But aim high. Aim big. All right? Aim for the, like, like I know you all want. You want to work in big films. You want to work in, you know, the next Avatar, the next blockbuster thing. So in those cases, you know, all the rendering procedures and pipelines and, and decisions are made by someone else. It's not made by you. Someone will come to you and tell you, this is the shell for rendering. This is the things that you need to do. This button creates the AOVs. This button creates um, special lights that work with the particular version of the render engine of that particular studio. You know, as you can imagine, they cannot have, uh, you know, a crew of a thousand people or 50 effects TDs and every single person will have their own way to make AOVs and all that. That all is standardized is run by the lighting and comp department. So you will have very little to say on that. So don't worry. What they will want you to do is very, you know, be very specific with changes in particle motion, with attributes that the particle will need to carry for the render engine. That's a different thing. That definitely will cover it. Um, but it's particle behavior. You know, they want to be able to tell you, you know, why Luis or Maurizio or Fabrizio, whoever, uh, this particle right here is not in the right place. I want you to kill it. I want you to get rid of it. Or I want it to make it double. Or I want it to do egg digs and this and that. Okay, that's perfect. Or they will tell you, hey, Louis, um, why don't you have an attribute for color accumulation on this part or particle density or who, who knows? All right, that's perfect. That's your job. Don't try to spread too thin because you won't be able to accomplish anything productive. Okay, so let's focus on being the best effects TDs that we can be. There are many courses on render engines. Uh, you know, there's RenderMan, there's Arnold, there's Mentor Ray, there's God knows what. There's so many different ways, different things. Once you get to a studio, a new brand new studio, one that says you're working on a film and you get used to the pipeline and you're working well and you finished and you go to the next film in another company. Guess what? You're going to have to learn their rendering pipeline all over again. First thing they're going to do, they're going to sit you down. They're going to give you what they call the wiki page of the studio. And they're going to tell you, hey, you know what, Louis? You know, you have a week to, 
practice. Here's a practice shot from the previous film that we did. Here's all the steps you need to follow. These are the buttons you need to push in order to get a render through. Yeah, it takes a long time. So there's no point of you know getting various and wasting, in my opinion, wasting time on getting to you know rendering in Maya uh, for this particular thing when you're going to be rendering many other ways. Of course, we're going to have to hit render every now and then. That's the only way to see you know color and things like that. Um, but that's very important, okay? Simulation, particle motion, fields, expressions, fluids, rigid bodies. This is it. This is what you need to learn right now. All right? So perfect. So yeah, I created a few things just to talk and open the discussion about particles and the many wonderful things I can do. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so here's the scene file, okay? I will begin slowly. Like I said, if you think I'm going too fast and uh, there are some things that are being skipped or something, it's not um, the plan. I mean, it's not, it's not, I don't want to make a duplicate course of the previous one, of the 2013. There's no, there's no, op, there's no reason why I should do that. But you can always refer to that one as well. So perfect. So let's, I'm going to keep that around just to, to talk about it. Um, so a couple of things you need to set up before you begin. Particles are being calculated on a per frame basis. What does it mean? It's not an animation. Animation, uh, the, the Maya timeline, which is right here, you will have to do whatever it takes to display as close as real time as possible. For effects, we don't want that. We want Maya to go frame by frame and don't skip anyone I'm right here. So don't skip any frames. I want Maya to evaluate every frame. So that's the first thing. If, you, if, if Maya is not evaluating uh, on every frame, then you're going to get exploding particles, expressions that don't run correctly, uh, soft bodies that explode, rigid bodies that just uh, you know don't do what you expect to do. So make sure that always, first thing you do when you get a brand new version of Maya and you get a new studio or at home, just go to the animation settings and make sure that the playback speed under the time slider, you know, let's say that you're on, over here, you go to time slider, which is that thing right here. And you make sure that the playback speed is set to play every frame. Animators and modelers and all that, they used to work in real time. That's easier. When you hit play, then Maya will, you know, if it has the resources, Maya will show you things as they should be the 24 frames per second, but not for us. So play every frame. The max uh, playback speed is up to you. If you have a strong computer and you're working at home and everything, you can just keep it at free. What free means is Maya, it will evaluate every frame, but if it's a very simple scene, Maya may go faster than 24 frames a second. So it will show you things a bit a bit quicker. Um, I will tell you right now that I have my heads up display activated. I'll show you where to put that right now. These are the frames per second that Maya will show me. So I'll, I'll keep it on free so you can see. If you have a very strong video card, then you will have a very quick uh, you know, um, reaction, a very quick feedback from Maya. Uh, that could be good and that could be sometimes a bit uh, misleading if you, don't know, if you don't know what you're doing very well. So make sure play every frame is set up, hit save. Another thing, you're working on effects right now, you're working on dynamics. So the dynamics menu should be on effects, sorry, the, the effects menu should be activated. Same thing, you get different menus for different tools. So the effects menu is the one you need. Um, as you can see, if you compare this to my previous course, it started the exact same way. The animation settings or the, the, the playback speed settings are in the same place, right here. The effects menus is also right here. Everything is here. They're pretty much the same way. They move a couple of things from left to right and right to left, but um, it is the same thing. Um, so keep, keep you know you, you start seeing that you know what I, what I was trying to tell you that there's no there was no point of recording the 2013 course on its own just yet because there's nothing nothing special right now. Of course there are some very big tools like Bifrost on or or all the things that well that's just additions to the software. But the way that particles work and expressions and fields and all that it is exactly the same way. Well anyway, I just wanted to tell you that um, yes there's a little bit different. Before it used to be called particles right here the menu and we used to have the end particles on a separate menu called end dynamics which was in a different tab not anymore now everything is merged into the effects thing actually it's kind of nice the fact that it says end particles here doesn't mean that the part maya particles have disappeared 
No, not at all. They actually, if you hit on them on the end particles menu, you'll see that you have the you just actually they merge two things together: the end particles and the particles menus. They, they merge them into just one big list, and they call now uh, the older particles. They call them the legacy particles. But everything is right here: create emitters, springs, emit from objects, everything. Okay, the particle tool even survived. Okay, the soft bodies, everything is just uh, where it should be, in the same place. They call them legacy particles, doesn't mean they will be extinct or everything will disappear and or they're useless. Actually, I prefer them still to end particles. I prefer them for prototyping, I prefer them for speed, uh, ease, to, ease of use. Um, you know, don't, don't try to use a bazooka to kill the fly. Little by little. That's the big mistake the Houdini guys used to make, and then they still make. They, they just try to overcomplicate things. Even this procedural and everything. I'm not going to be talking about that software because I, I honestly don't want to waste my breath on that. But it's not worth it. Okay? Start simple and keep it simple. And keeping it simple doesn't mean that it's cheap or it's going to look bad or anything. No. If you're smart, then you can do it 100 times faster than any of those uh, you know, complicated networks and tools and fancy names and all that. So the legacy particles, call me old fashioned, call me old school, call me whatever, dinosaur, I don't, I don't care, but they do work, man. They have worked in the biggest films that you guys have watched. The films that have made you want to get into the industry and the one that have made you want to, you know, take this course and learn and, you know, become, you know, get a new career probably. Um, they were made with this and they never fail. So we do have the end particles and we will use them when it's necessary. But the other particles are all here. So with that, if you uh, are taking the 2013 course, okay, and you want to um, recreate the example from, from that course, don't feel like if you open Maya 2017, then it's, you're gonna, not gonna be able to do it. It is. The only thing you need to know ahead of time is that the part, end particles menu is what it was called, the particles menu, and everything is right here. From that point forward, it's exactly the same. Simple as that. So perfect. So, okay, you're on the effects menu, you got your playback speed right where you should be. Sometimes, you know, I like to give myself a bit more room to work, so a couple hundred frames. Uh, another thing, if you are new to the interface and, you know, you're kind of lost right now what I'm talking about, don't worry. The FX Power User Program 2013 has a very nice Introduction of the interface called Intro to Maya Dynamics, um, done by Igor, my good friend Igor, who, you know, he was the first uh, VFX learning student, and now he's a superstar doing God knows how many films. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it's amazing what he can do now. So I'm very proud of him. I'm very happy. I'm very thankful for it because of that course that he did. He did it in 2013, but it's exactly the same thing, man. He's going to be, he's going to be explaining to you uh, the timeline, keyframing, a bit of modeling, the basics. Things that I don't want to uh, spend time myself doing because I want to focus on my thing. So if you're getting stuck right now, then don't worry. Pause this video. Go back to the intro for Maya for uh, intro to Maya for Dynamics, and go go ahead and watch the lessons and get you know acquainted with the interface. Anyway, you will see me using it so much that I don't think it's going to be a problem. So perfect. So everything that you need is already there. Probably what your Maya will look like this with the grid. Make sure you get a three-button mouse, um, you know, because you're going to need to zoom in and out and things like that. Aside of that, perfect, let's begin. So particles. You can place particles in your scene uh, in many different ways. Like I always say in my courses, one type of effect can be done in many different ways. Just like there's a hundred different softwares, there's a there's hundred different ways to do it. And, and I'm not saying that my way is the only and best and, and is the one you want to follow. Okay, that's the one that I find myself better and the one I use in film. So if I raise myself to put this into production and, and, and if I want, if I feel that it, you know, it's worth teaching it and to save you time and to make you a better artist, then you know, I, I think it's, it's been proven to work. But obviously I want you to experiment. This is the key of this course. I want you to try new things. I want you to combine concepts. It's impossible for me to teach you every single effect that you see on, on screen, on, on TV, and in film, and everything. It's impossible. But I can teach you enough tools for you to create anything that you see. That's a different thing. So that's what I want you to do. So particles, you can be placed. You can place them on the screen and, and in many different ways. 
the, the first choice that you will get uh, to make is always um, based on the type of effect that you have, your deadline. There are many different top, you know, conditions that you need to evaluate before you decide how to, you know, tackle a particular effect. Uh, and and we will, we will, the, the living example of that will be once we get to the effect prototyping course, because those, those are decisions that are going to make a big, big difference in your budget, uh, in your bidding, and your uh, probability of getting a project or a sh particular shot in your case. Um, so yeah, particles, many different ways. If you go to the, again, to the air particles menu, then um, the particle tool was is the most basic one. That's the way it begins. My other course begins with this one. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Um, but basically the particle tool is just a way of sketching particles into your scene. So let's say that you have a particular way. Uh, let me open the outliner so you can see what's happening. Here we go. And in the outliner, there's nothing at the moment, nothing special. This is the basic notes that you get when you open your Maya scene. So um, I can just sketch particles, as you have right here, meaning that I'll be drawing particles in my scene. There is a little red dot right here. And if I click and click and click, there's nothing else being added to my outliner. But there's things on the scene that definitely exist. Something is there. These are going to become a particle system. Right now, they're just particles that I'm placing, you know, on a specific position. Okay? Very useful, but very, uh, well, you know, it's kind of forgotten, probably, that tool. Okay, so you click, 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 nothing happens on the outline until you hit enter. There we go, you get your first particle system. This is what it is. The grid we don't need right now. Let's get rid of it. And if you go to wireframe, then you can see them better. Just, you know, sitting like this, it might be nothing to you. Okay, wait, 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 what's, what's, what's the big deal? Yeah, and just that by looking at them like that, there's nothing. But let's, let's say that those are, you know, they could become buildings in a scene or they could become explosions or positions for, you know, a particular event. Uh, and then that way they have to be in a specific position. So it is useful. It is, you know, quite interesting. I'll let you play with it. You know, like I said, on the, my previous course, I go a little bit, you know, in depth of, of that. I'm not going to do it in this one. Out. Uh, if I go back to the particle tool, then again, you can... Um, like I said, we hit one at a time, okay? You can also create a, uh, this is per click, I put one particle. I could probably do three particles. And you can see that once the number changes from one to anything else, or anything higher than one, um, then the maximum radius will become available. If I hit one time and I hit enter, it does look like there is one particle in the scene. In the scene. But if I go to my particle shape node right here, there is a cool little thing right here that says count, and it says three. But how come if you only see one point? Well, there's because uh, there's three particles on top of each other. Don't let that happen. Okay? You don't want particles occupying the same space all the time. There will be cases that is out of your reach, and, and there's nothing you can do about it. But this you can resolve. Three particles on top of each other is just a headache, and it's a waste of resources. It might not seem like much with three, but when you have three million or, or you know three billion, then you know it's a big problem. You don't want particles occupying the same space. We always fight to get the least amount of particles covering the most amount of space possible. So having three particles on top of each other is terrible. That can be solved if you uh, just use the maximum radius. If I put the maximum radius to one unit, then if I hit, I get three. Just get a bit closer, probably, and imagine a, a sphere or a circle, well, a sphere, actually, around uh, where, you, where you click of a radius of one diameter. Well, okay, actually, a radius of one. Um, and they will place the particles randomly within that space. That's basically what it's going to do. Again, there's nothing in here because I haven't hit enter. If I hit enter, they get one particle system with three particles that are positioned in this way. Great. Nothing fun yet. Uh, and again, uh, you can just uh, draw. Draw. 
This one we'll be definitely using on the prototyping course. Once we have to start drawing herds of animals, for example, this is a very cool, easy way to do it. You enter, there you go. This could be your, I don't know, predators. I'll talk about it when on that course comes. I don't want, I don't want to get uh, carried away on that conversation. But basically, you can see, you can draw. And you can draw on surfaces by making the surface live. Again, refer to that other video. That's better for that. Exact same way in both softwares. There you go, out. I'm done with the particle tool. I'm not going to talk about that right now. It's not worth my time and your time. So let's jump right into the fun stuff. Um, that's one way to place particles. Okay. The other way to place particles is to create what is called a particle emitter. There we go. Options for it. Let's take a quick look. And particle emitters are, um, well, it's what we use nine out of ten times. You know, we can emit particles based on expressions. We can emit particles of other particles. But at the end of the day, uh, the particle emitters are, you know, this is the most common thing to do. They come in different uh, flavors. And they say they come uh, what is called the omni emitter, a directional emitter, a volume emitter, and also you can emit particles off surfaces, which is the probably one of the most used techniques. A particle emitter's job, okay, is to place particles in the scene or let or release them into your scene. Um, an example would be best. Let's go ahead and create an omni emitter. Leave everything as default. And you create. What happens? Creates a particle emitter right here on my list in a particle system. Remember that before you didn't have this emitter. And what happens if I hit play right now? If I hit play, you can see that I'm getting, uh, obviously because it's a very simple scene. A very simple scene. There's nothing special here. There's 595 particles. Any computer, any phone can do this. So no, don't worry about it. That's why I'm getting uh, I was getting 144 frames a second. Keep uh, keep an eye right here, okay, in this corner of the of the of the screen. When I hit play, 140, 116 frames a second. Um, so what what does it mean? That means that it's uh, what almost five times faster than real time. So when you hit play, you will see them at a certain speed, but that's not going to be the real speed. Remember, that's why I have this turned on. And you will ask, well, where do you turn that on? And of course, you go to window, sorry, display, heads up display, display, heads up display, and you go to what is called frame rate. Frame rate will show this thing right here, and I think it's a good idea to have it. The more particles you have, the more your system will suffer, and this number will become smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you will get back to the real world when you know things are kind of slow. Effect simulations are slow. Be patient. Right? Become a master of that. Right? And exercise patience. Uh, don't worry about it. Things work that way. That's the way it is. There's never a fast enough or a stronger computer. You always want something better. If you get a brand new computer, then you put more particles in it just to see how far it goes. And you will complain on every single movie that you make. I mean, that's a, that's a historical thing. Um, just to get the cat out of the bag and clear the air, my computer, okay, is... Because, you know, before I do that, I, sometimes I hear, yeah, but you have a, such a strong computer that that's what you can teach the course, that's what you can do the effects and look better. No, man, that's that's not the way it works, you know. Yes, I do have a, a, a decent computer. Okay, I could have a better one. Uh, I have a decent computer because, yes, I have to record the course. Don't forget, I'm recording this thing as well as doing this thing. And I don't want you guys to sit there with me for 20 minutes, just expect, you know, waiting for something that it could be done faster in a better machine. Um, just the reason. You will take this course and you will get the effect as complex and as detailed as you can. Don't worry about it. Don't feel like, you know, you. there's no need to learn. If, if you've seen the computer that I use when I learned these things, you'll be, so you'll be amazed. Like I said, it was back in year 2000, bro. That was 16 years ago. It was a shitty laptop, a, a, a Dell, I think it was a Sony Vio laptop, right? And um, Maya 3, uh, you know, forget about it. You know, all the, all the cool things that we have nowadays, the cool toys and video cards. No, it was a laptop. 
Why was I allowed to? Because I had to sit on my mom's kitchen table, man. I didn't have a desk. I didn't have a, my own room. It was horrible. But I did learn. And here I am. And so can you. So don't worry. If you have a, a small computer and that's all you can afford, don't you worry. Do it. Learn. It's not like you're going to take that computer to a studio and, and use it at work. They're not going to tell you, hey, Louis, bring your computer. We're going to work on Avatar. Go ahead. No, man. Then they, that's their problem. They will you know, make sure to set you up with the best machine you have. And learning doesn't have anything to do with the machine that you have at all. As long as obviously you can watch this video. And, and, and the, the proof of that is that you can watch these classes from your phone, from your tablet, from whatever, right? So there is no excuse. So put the amount of particles and the voxels and everything as far as you can, as your machine will handle. That's it. And depending on the time that you have. If you have a simulation that looks well, and looks fine and everything is working, then probably you can crank it up a little bit more during the night and let it run. Probably you go off for the weekend with your girlfriend or your wife or your, your friend, then why not? Then just leave it running on Friday, come back on Sunday and see what it looks like. So be creative. That's what we do. Do you think that we, on production, we uh, do high resolution simulations and renders during the day? No, man, not at all. We use our days to produce... Uh, workable scenes okay to work out our bugs and put our expressions and test it up to a certain point and then everything at six o'clock or whatever it's the time to go home that's where you set up the big simulations and your renders so let the computer work for you when it's there you know that's 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 the best feeling in the world once you start freelancing and you start working and once you can go home and let the computer work while you sleep and while you're you know going to the gym or whatever that's the best thing so, you know, very, very careful with that. Don't blame your computer. Don't blame your RAM. Don't blame that. No, you learn. Learn. Get all this information. Locate the attributes on the screen. Uh, you know, get, understand what I'm saying. And then time will come when you will have a better machine. That's not going to be a problem. That's not something they're going to ask you on your um, work job interview or anything. No. And a demo reel doesn't have to always be rendered. Uh, full on, you know, you can show very cool particle simulations of just a play blast. In a play blast, you can run it on any machine uh, during the night or whatever you want. So there are ways, man. Uh, yes, you can. Yes, it is possible. Trust me, I come from nothing. Nothing. I, I was very, very poor and I had nothing. I had to borrow um, from my girlfriend to, to buy a first computer and it was a very terrible thing and I had to, you know, I will, I will do a, a lesson, just a lesson or a, probably a I don't know how you call that, probably just a chat with you guys. And I'll tell you my whole story and you will see what I mean. So perfect. So uh, my computer at the moment is one of, oops, what's this? Sorry, one sec. Okay, here we go. I'm going to turn that down. This is ridiculous. Here you go. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so yeah, my computer is an iMac 5K of 27 inch because I need the screen space. I just bought it, but it says late 2015. I bought it about a month ago. Um, here's the processor that I have. Here's my RAM. Okay, and I have a lot of uh, hard drive space because I have to record particles. I have to record the classes, you know, oof, so many things. So this is my machine. Um, that's the video card. I even have uh, people on Facebook make fun of me. Uh, you know, that, that video card is not enough to open uh, Google Chrome or something. So how, how do I expect to teach with that? But well, you'll see, you know, that's that's ridiculous. So again, don't blame your computer. This is a you know very cool computer to work. I prefer to work at Mac. That's just a prefer, personal preference. Um, but there you go. That's those are my specs. So with that being said, that's why, you know, it's a it's a, it's a good video card. It's, it's two gigs. It's much better than what I had on Avatar back then. Um, so that's what you get a you know very quick feedback on this. So back to the conversation. So the emitter um, is just pumping out particles. Um, there are there's nothing else in my scene other than an emitter and the particle system. So why are they moving? You wonder. When 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 we drew the particles, there was no motion. So why are they moving? It's because basically the emitter. Okay, like, like I said, the emitter's job is just to um, release the particles into the scene. And when, when the, the emitter by default, he has already, because 
it has a speed attribute, so it's actually shooting particles out. It's giving every particle a speed, an initial speed. Imagine this environment right now when we're working right here. Imagine this as a, a outer space. This outer space. Why is it outer space? Because there is no gravity. There is no atmosphere, so there's no friction. These particles will continue to move with that initial bump. Okay, if I put this to, instead of 200 frames, I put it to 2,000 frames. They will continue to move on to infinity. Wow, infinity sounds very cool, but now until your computer runs out of RAM, <laughs> you run out of time, well, you know, the timeline runs out. But they will continue to move unless they, they face another force. So this is outer space. If you're going to work in the movie Gravity, for example, when we worked on that, you know, the first thing you need to do is just what? Remove gravity. And the drag is something that, you know, technically shouldn't be there. Um, so this, this is what it is. So particles, the emitter, okay, is pushing every particle right when it's born and it's giving it a little bit of speed. And it's just releasing them into the, into the environment. So what does it mean? I mean, the particles have, when they're born, they come along with a, a list of attributes, such as uh, age, and um, initial speed, and uh, probably well, direction, of course, a mass. And, you know, the list is quite long, right, of, of attributes that your particle can carry, information that can carry with them. Um, but the initial push is done by the emitter. So I pick my emitter. An omni-emitter, as you can see, is pushing particles in a spherical way. So it's pushing them in every single direction. It has randomness to make it look cool. So well, particles are done in, you know, as you can see, they're very, you know, random pattern, but it's a spherical pattern. So it works as a point light. Just as a point light. It emits light in all directions. This emits particles in every single direction. So keep that in mind. So my emitter, you can uh, tweak attributes just by working on the attribute editor, which is this, or the channel box. I don't know if you agree with me, but the channel box looks a bit more organized than the attribute editor for now. There are times that you work on one or the other, but right now it looks kind of neat right here. Now the list of an emitter, uh, you can see there's quite a long list, but the, the um, omni emitter is not a very fancy emitter, it's not a very sophisticated thing, it's just all directions with a little bit of speed done. How many particles per second you want done? That's all it's going to ask you. So why do I have such a long list? It's simple. It's because, because since the beginning of time, since I learned this thing, Maya has always showed all the attributes for all the emitters that they exist. So it doesn't mean that the attributes listed here are uh, only for this emitter. So you will find here volume offset. But this is not a volume emitter. All right, so don't worry about it. So basically all you need to worry with this kind of emitter is what is called the rate. And the rate is the amount of particles per uh, second. So every 24 frames. You will see it probably, let me see if they change that. If you go to the attribute editor and you find the rate, yeah, it's the same. It says particles over a second. So right now 100 means that for every 24 frames I'm going to get 100 particles. Very easy for you to determine the amount of particles you're going to have in a scene. You can predict it quite quickly. So there you go. So back to the channel box because it looks nicer. So all you need to worry about is the rate. And all you need to worry about is the speed attribute right here. If I put that to zero. And you rewind and hit play. You always have to rewind and hit play to reevaluate the scene, obviously. I mean, I said obviously, obviously to me, not obviously to you, maybe. Um, you need to, all right? If, you, if I hit play and continue to, to play back my scene, then it's going to be a mess. Because you're going to have all particles already there with different uh, birth attributes and conditions, and the new ones coming right back. So good uh, word of advice, always rewind and play to reevaluate everything clean. Also... If, if, I don't think I'll forget it. I will remind you many times. But um, when you save a scene file and save often, put sticky notes around your screen, an alarm on your phone, 
whatever you, whatever it takes, your dog around, and I don't know, whatever tool you need to save, save, save often. Don't waste uh, time. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, the frequency of your save is the amount of time that you're willing to lose. So if you can afford to lose uh, two hours of your work every day, then save every two hours. <laughs> I dare you. I don't think so. So save as often as you can. Obviously, on things like this, I've, I've just been talking. I can recreate what I've told you in the whole class in, in five seconds. So obviously, that's why I haven't saved. Um, but my point is, when you save your scene, never save it on a frame. So don't don't do this. So don't go. Well, okay. You can see the particles are not there. Then that's probably what you will say. Probably there's no particles. What do you do? You change the speed and the thing turns off. Here's my speed and the thing turns off. No, it doesn't turn off. And this is the best thing you can do always. You know, you can always check uh, selecting the particle system and going to the attributes. I use this count attribute many times. I always keep an eye on it. There's 1,437 particles on top of each other right there. I can even zoom in close enough, but they're right here, right on top of each other. So it hasn't turned off. It's not an on and off switch, the speed. It's basically that. It's just uh, the particles are born on that particular point, and they don't move. Okay, so go back to one. But my point is, uh, um, let me just rewind, hit play, and there they are, just as before. So what I was saying earlier is that don't do this and save your scene right now, hit save, because you have your particles right here, it's frame 261, don't do that, don't do that. Why not? Because when you reopen Maya, Maya is gonna have to recreate this as best as possible, so it's going to have to play back up to frame 261. In this case, it takes probably a second or two. But once you have a waterfall, once you have fire, or I don't know, all the many things that we're going to be doing in the course, and it takes you probably an hour to get to frame 261, then it means that every time you open your file, you're going to have to wait an hour to use it. Terrible. So always, always rewind and save. All right, back to this conversation here. So the speed attribute, um, then you can see what it does. If I hit play, in 108 frames, they got this far. If I double the speed, okay, in 100, less than 100 frames, then it got further away. Simple. That's all there is. Okay, that's all I want to say about the emitter, the omni emitter. Because nothing else to say. Simple. Let's go ahead and do the next one. So let's create another emitter and make a volume emitter, for example. Hit create. Same thing, emitter plus particle. And all the attributes that we have, you know, well, all the attributes. The two attributes that we talked about, speed and rate, work exactly the same way on this one. So rate, same thing, 100 particles per second. You get a speed attribute, okay, that does work. Let me show you. So you hit play, and then you get that. And you will say, well, but it looks just like the Omni emitter. And yeah, that's right. It does. But it might do, you know, this one can do many things. It does look like the Omni emitter because it kind of tells you right here what's happening. They're born in this point, and they're moved in every direction. Yeah. In a spherical way. Out. Based on what? Based on the speed. Yes. But it's also based, I'm um, sorry, let me just get my emitter. It's based on the speed. So if I hit speed zero, aha, what happens? They keep moving, right? Because the volume emitters, they have their own set of attributes. They, all, you know, they have attributes of, of uh, for speed. And keep an eye on the arrows in here. So then you scroll down. I like to make the mistakes that you would probably make when you start playing this thing. Um, so don't worry about it. If it's a volume emitter, then you will get a lot of attributes that have the word volume in them. That is a hint. Um, so perfect. Then you find here that you get um, everything down the bottom right here uh, implies, uh, actually, it is for the volume emitter. So you get a speed, which is a zero. You see that it does nothing. You get a speed random. But we'll talk about it in a second. But you do get... Um, down here, you get away from center, away from axis, along axis, around axis. These guys 
okay, are responsible of the way the particles will move. Right now it says away from center, it is to one. It means yes, right? If I set it to negative one, check the arrows, the arrows invert. So everything just comes back into this point. The result of this, as you can imagine, visually, it might be similar. <laughs> right? I mean, it's cool in the center. You can see what's happening in the center. The particles are coming, you know, they're being born inside this volume. They're rushing into the center, but they go past it. So eventually, they start to look the same thing. With the aggregate of a cool, you know, core kind of thing going on. So this is the away from center. Away from center, okay, back to one. And then you get away from axis, and the axis at the moment, that's, that's better looked at on the cylindrical volume, but because there's nothing right now, there's no center axis in here. So there we go. There's nothing, everything looks the same. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna go attribute by attribute. Like I said, you know, you can refer to that on from my other course, the 2013 version. It's the same, same attributes on that one. Uh, but you do get many of these things. Uh, you get a long axis, you get a round axis as well. I'm sorry, let me just set it to one. And look at that, when I hit that, okay, it has an axis right here. And he has this arrow right here. So the particles are going to have, not only uh, they're going to be pushed away from the center, but they're also going to have this kind of motion. Let's take a look. You can see. Excellent. So uh, I'm pretty sure you're not getting the point with this emitter that is a very, uh, it's a lot more interesting. It has a lot more powerful tool than the other one. So play with this one. Play with that. That's just ways of placing particles in the scene. Nothing, I'm not, I'm not surprised yet. Um, done with this one. The directional emitter is boring, man. That's not, I don't know. That's one, I, I, don't, I don't get it. It's kind of lame. Directional emitter. Look. That's it. Yes, you can you know, probably put expressions and play a little bit with it, but uh, rate is the same, speed is the same attribute, and then you have a direction. Right now it's going in the positive x. You can see that it matches my scene right here. You change that and put it to y. And for this, I'm going to rewind so you can kind of see the difference. There we go. So unless you're working on Tron, the old school version, or I don't care, I don't know, <laughs> an 80s video game, I don't see that much of a use of this. But it does give you particles in a straight line, and you can specify the vector right here. Done. No need to talk about this. And the favorite one is the surface emitter. So for that, you need a surface. And well, what, what, what everyone will everyone will do is just um, sorry, just create a plane. That's what everyone does. Here we go. I'm upside down. There you go. So everyone creates a plane with this plane, this piece of geometry. I can tell Maya to emit particles of it. So let's go ahead and do it. And particles. Now, if you can see the, the list of emitters right here, it has only these three. And we talked about them already. And I don't think we need to discuss them. We don't need to discuss them anymore. Um, but it's not the surface emission. So how, how come? No worries. Down here it says emit from object. And you can emit particles not only from uh, surfaces, but also from curves. And you can emit particles from other particles, which we'll get to that later because that's very useful. So for now, you can select this uh, emit from object, emit from object option, and then you go to surface. You also have an omni, and I'll explain that later. Uh, but basically, it's for particles emitting particles. You get a directional as well, but you what you really care for in this particular case is the surface emission. Same thing, you get rate, you get speed. Hit create. 
where is the emitter? You see the particle, but there's no emitter. No, it is it's under my surface. It's parented under. Because you want your surface, when you move, the emitter to move. So the emitter is right there. You can actually see it right here. There it is. Perfect. So let's see what this is going to do. We went and play, and there we go. Same concept. Now the particles um, are going up. There is no fields attached to them. But you already know that is because the particle emitter has a speed attribute. Now you need to combine two things for surface emission. And they're going to multiply each other. The speed attribute will multiply another attribute uh, that is going to dictate uh, the direction where the emitter will push the particles away. Right now, you can see that the tangent speed is 0 and the normal speed is 1. What is tangent and what is normal? Simple. Okay, the normal of a surface, okay, is a perpendicular vector that goes from any point of that surface. Done. You can go to math in high school and read more about it if you want. But that's what you want, the normal of the surface, okay? And you'll also get the tangent of the surface, which is a line that runs in parallel of a particular point on the surface. So right now, my particles are being emitted with a normal speed of 1, in a tangent of zero, so it's using the normal of this surface. And this tangent, I'm sorry, this normal speed is being multiplied by my speed. So one multiplied by one is one, that's why these guys move. Obviously, if, if I set my speed to zero, then the particles stay on the surface regardless of the normal speed being 1, because obviously they're multiplying each other. Again, uh, put this to 1, and I switch my tangent speed to 1, and my normal speed to 0, and now I get particle shooting okay, in this direction. And I'm not sitting next to you, man, but I can hear your brain just thinking and imagining cockroaches or ants or people or running or uh, there we go. That's the mind of an FXTD being born. That's, that's, what, that's what it needs to happen. There we go. It looks like termites or bugs or something. Something kind of common by looking at it. So there we go. But you can see there's nothing going on in Y, in the Y direction. There's nothing going in the height. Combination of both, right? You might think, oh, why don't we try both? Let's try both. Let's go ahead and set my normal speed also to 1. Leaving the tangent at 1, then you get some really cool with no field, man. That's, 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 the, that's the really nifty thing about this. Interesting shape. Very cool. Nothing is going to go below your ground plane or, or your emitter. Uh, at least not right now without adding forces or things like that. So perfect. I love it. Play with it. Enjoy it. But I want to do something nicer. That's surface emission for now. But that's the basics of it. I want to go right away and get rid of this and jump into going from what we talked so far to then, you know, some... Uh, Cool pictures like this, and, and you know, I kind of, I kind of, I shouldn't have opened my scene, or I don't know, maybe, maybe I did, I don't know, but you might know where this comes from, you know, this shape. But my, the challenge that I want to give you, and my first assignment for you, is to come up with interesting. Uh, I don't want to call them galaxies, but well, let's say galaxies. But I want, I want every, I want anything, man. I want interesting particle color. Interesting particle shapes um, placed on the scene, and, and you will tell me. You know, once we meet on the on the one on one uh, virtual classroom thing, um, you will tell me what you're going after with that, and what you think it could be used for later. If I show you this image for us right now, it could be many things. It's not the most beautiful frame picture. I don't want to hear it, man. I know what I'm doing, and I'm not talking to you guys. You know, you know, I love you guys. Uh, I'm just talking with the haters out there. There's always someone 
Someone's gonna, you know, have a smart ass comment. So for those, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm saying. Yes, this might not be the best particle render or anything. I don't care. It's less than one. You know, I don't know how long we've been doing this, but I don't think it's been an hour. Um, and look how far we got. And I'm going slower. I, could, I wish I could go a little bit faster, but I don't want to scare you. Um, so yeah, I, I want you guys for an assignment to place on a scene and give me some cool, cool colors, cool shapes, ideas of what this could be morphed and mutated into. I mean, what else do you think you could use it for? All right. So I, I have a few examples. Just colors. And I challenge someone else uh, outside of this family that we have right now here in the effects masters group but I challenge them to do in the amount of time that you will do a, a particle distribution with similar shapes and similar colors using a different technique I doubt it all right don't care which software they use so here we go you can see um, what's coming what we're gonna be talking about next is um, what I want you to see is the, the, the changes of color on these particles and the shapes of course right so you know you can see that there's, there's a lot of variation and particles you're not going to be able to paint them one at a time so we need to come up with interesting ways to get color um, from images onto the particles that's the that's the easiest way to work so let's go right onto that i will take questions of course you know this is not being taught live i'm recording this at the moment some some lessons once we get up to speed and once i i myself get a rhythm for these lessons and things i will try to um come up with times and i just don't want to be tied up i cannot be tied up to a specific time of the day to record i need to have certain freedom i don't want this course to be like others from other people i hate it man when I learned that those things are prepared and they got notes with numbers written on, that's cheating. That's not real life. That's not the real world. So I don't want that. I, I want I want to be able to prepare my scenes, you know, as, as I see, because I go I go to the to the movies every day, pretty much every day to the cinema. Well, I try to go as much as possible, um, and I get new ideas every day. I'm trying to go to the Formula One race, for example. I'm a big fan of that. Um, and when I go, I'm pretty sure I want to come up with some new example for a new lesson. So this is this is a, uh, almost like a year in the life of a TD kind of course, you know. Um, so I don't want to be tied up. But what I'm trying to say with this is that sometimes, you know, I will do my best to at least send you a notification and say, hey, well, you know, guys, in half hour, I'm going to start recording if you guys want to come and have a bit of interaction with you and get your questions live. I think it's always very good to have. Um, but in this case, you know, the lessons that have been recorded like this and just write them down, post them on the Facebook group publicly. Don't, don't, and so I'm not going to want to talk to you. You know, I wish I could talk to everyone all the time, but I cannot be answering private emails all the time. I'm sorry, but I won't do it. I want you guys to, you know, don't be shy and then just talk to each other. All oh, this is a magnificent group. It's so diverse. I have people from China, Japan. Um, in Latin America, in North America, in Europe, every single continent, even in Africa. So you guys will, you know, you'll be amazed of uh, the diversity of this group and the cool ideas and, and backgrounds from people. So post them on the group, get everyone involved, um, and I'll be sure make sure to answer them there. But I also will include them on my next recording. So I say, you know, I got this this question from the previous class, so let's go talk about it a little bit. Um, so keep that in mind. Let's jump right in. So I have this little file which I'm going to give you. Um, just open my scene file. Well, I think it goes without saying, you have to set up your project. That's the part of the intro to my uh, kind of topic. But when you start, when you begin working on your shots, then you go to file, then you go to, if you if it's a new project, well, you, you know, you can go to the project window, for example and create a new project for yourself. What a project is, is a collection of folders that will look just like this. Let me go to mine, just the documents, Maya projects. Each one of these folders is a project. So it's a project I was working on. I want my effects masters, and this is my project. So I have all these folders, are, you know, it's the exact same thing you have here. Maya will make those for you. 
Um, so I recommend you to do that so you don't have things all you know running around all over your computer. So create your project. Uh, if you have already created it, when you begin working for the first time, make sure you set your project. So find your, in my case is the effects masters, and I set it. I'm basically telling Maya, okay, this is my file structure, this is my project, go look for things where you know, Maya, you know where to look for things inside this folder. So there we go. So when I hit open, Maya already goes into my scenes folder for my project, and it shows me what I have in here. Uh, this is my effects masters uh, scene file, okay, oh, scene folder, I'm sorry. So I will have things uh, scramble from future classes and all that. I will be uploading things as needed, so you don't guys get ahead of yourself. I know some of you are very excited and want to start opening scenes from, you know, three months from now, and that's going to be counterproductive. Stay focused. So for this one, I'm going to be using this little guy which is this thing. You have seen it before in my other course. Sadly, this is the only thing I model in my life. And, and it might be ugly, but I, I, I kind of you know, love him because he's, uh, he's been around. This thing I did it probably 15 years ago. It's, it's faithful. <laughs> uh, so there you go, my little aliens. I'm going to give it to you guys. Take good care of him. Um, simple geometry. It comes with a little skeleton right here you show the joints there you go so it's very simple if you find mocap uh, motion capture files you can probably map them to this one because it's very easy everything is named uh, it used to be a software called motion builder which I think out of this bought it they buy everything um, so probably you can map a new motion capture into this little guy so you know treat them nice it's a nice thing so there we go, here's my model. And this one has already an animation. Let me just hide the joints because it's not, I'm gonna hide everything. Sorry, I'm gonna hide everything and I'm only gonna show his poly body, which is right there. There you go. He has eyes that are made of nerves, but I don't need them right now. So there we go, so he has animation. There we go. He has a, a motion capture clip applied to him. I'm gonna pause it right here. Stop moving, there we go. All right, so this pose, you can see that where things is coming from. It's almost that pose. So at a glance, when, when I posted the promotional images yesterday, when I was you know preparing the scene, uh, people are like, wow, cool, you know, and I love it. I love to see that you guys are excited, you know, about this. Um, and I probably, the more you get, the deeper you get into these courses, the, it's like life, you know, they probably, uh, you know, the more you learn, you realize that there's no Santa Claus, and then you see that the once you start understanding how things are done in films, a little bit of the magic goes away. <laughs> um but that's, that's life, that's the way it works. So now you can see probably the shape. And why I choose, chose this guy is, is he's very useful for geometry, it's very simple, it's quickly to, to move him around and evaluate it. Uh, I'm gonna let it move as it goes. Um, but it's just to show you that, you know, even you're gonna be emitting particles of his uh, body, his skin, uh, the particle, particle simulation and the particle system you don't have to think about it always as a character. Think of him for what he is. Obviously, he's a, it is a, a piece of geometry that is deforming, and it's an emitter, and it will put particles. But he won't. You know, he doesn't have to be rendered. He doesn't have to show up in anything. No one has to know. Well, the shape that he has. All I care for is the shape of the particle system that he will give me. So you can see that he's kind of fighting uh, some sort of storm or something. And of course, we will see him in pretty much you know every basic lesson. He's going to be around um, and play with him, test it for your things. But basically, what I see, what I see is an outline. I see, in my mind, I see an outline. I see shapes, right? I see things. And once I started meeting particles of him, then I might be getting some interesting stuff. At least you know, cool distributions. So here we go. This is you know one of the tests. Here's another. Okay, but it's the same character. Now, now you understand the shape, the head. 
okay, the feet, some of the arms, right? This one, for example, this is a very cool, and you, you know, start thinking of applications of this, uh, you know, some sort of kids movie or something where you need uh, some sort of galaxy shape in a funny way. I know you're working on the next uh, Peanuts movie and you get a galaxy of Snoopy with the shape of Snoopy, right? Well, then you're going to grab your character of Snoopy and you're going to do what we're going to teach you now. And there you go. And that's for funny stuff, for serious things. Who knows? That could be the shape of uh, Thor. Uh, like, like my, remember my other course? We did the Thor 3 at the beginning of the lesson. Well, there we go. So, you know, don't don't stop yourself uh, from from you just thinking of this as a shape that you want to be using when you need a character that looks funny as an alien. No, this is a piece of geometry that can be used for many things. So here we go. Let's go ahead and jump into this thing. Basically, what I need to do is emit particles of him. It's the same procedure as you did with the, the plane that, that we did a couple of minutes ago. Select him. And you're going to be in the effects menu, you're going to the end particles menu, you're going to emit from object, you're going to hit surface, and you're going to hit create. You open your outliner, and here you're going to have, don't worry about these things, I'm going to be removing some of these things. In a, actually, the scene file I'm going to give you is going to be cleaner than this one. It's the next one I'm going to open. I just want to show you how it works. So here's my particle system just as before. Here is the what is called the alien skin or his geometry, and underneath is the emitter. Done. Um, like I said, this this scene file is not the one the one I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a cleaner version. But right now, let's just move ahead with this. Hit rewind, and when you hit rewind, you can see that I'm starting on frame uh, minus ten. That's something that we need to talk about as well. Uh, simulations. The particles have a, an attribute called star frame. In the channel box right now we haven't talked much about the particle attributes that's what we're going to do right now um, so for the particles themselves um, the first thing you need to know is when which is the frame that they're going to begin simulating and by default is always frame one so in this case from frame negative 10 to frame one nothing's going to happen and we can go one by one because it's quick Okay, there's no particles, and on frame one, actually we're on frame two right now, then we probably, well, we haven't seen any particles yet, just because the dynamics are not being displayed. If I hit play, there we go, we get three particles right now, I think. Always good to know how many particles are being born, so let's go to the attribute editor for the particle shape, and yes, indeed, we have three particles on frame two. If I rewind and do this again, we get no particles from frame minus 10, nothing. All right, frame minus two, nothing. Frame zero, there's still nothing. Frame one, simulation begins. Frame two, we get three particles. So um, the fact that then the, sim the animation begins on negative 10 doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean that the simulation begins at that point. So, um, what does it mean? Well, it means that we can probably begin our scene on frame one right away. And here you go. There's my particles, the little green dots. Here's a simple piece of geometry. Don't think of him as a character right now. So what I mean by that is that he behaves, the, the emitter behaves the same way. He has a, a rate and he has a speed and he has a normal speed and a tangent speed, the same thing. So right now, the normal of this surface on each point will be a vector that goes perpendicular to that point. So it will be shooting particles in every direction. Done. Perfect. All right. What else do the particles have? Well, particles have, um, when they're born, they receive from the emitter the speed, and they're born with a particular uh, lifespan. That's the attribute, lifespan. Um, and what dictates the lifespan of the particle? This attribute down here. That's how long they're going to live. And this number is in seconds. So 24 frames. But keep an eye on something. If that's true, then how come it's frame 42 and there's still particles alive? If I hit play, the particles keep, you know, they stay alive. How come if you just told me that the lifespan of the particle is one, one second? 
and it's been what almost uh, well more than two seconds well it's just simple uh, because at the top there is a mode a life mode that you're gonna get for the particles and by default it's said to live forever these particles would just never die like I said on my previous example with the omniometer, they would just move and stay there until you run out of frames or you run out of RAM, whatever happens first. Um, so basically it's that, <clears throat> live forever. You can change that to constant, meaning that every single particle will have the same lifespan. Now, yes, dictated by this number. So rewind, hit play, and then you will see that these particles, keep an eye on these guys, they will start to disappear right about now. There we go. Done, done, gone, gone, gone. Something very important, okay, with particle emission. Keep an eye on your particle numbers. Don't have particles living outside of your camera view if they don't have to be there because the eating resources that can be used for something else. So the life plan of the particle is something you need to have an idea right at the beginning. If, if this effect needs to have the particles visible all the time, or they're going to be, you know, if it's living a trail, you know, how long is the trail going to be? And that's dictated by the lifespan. Another thing for effects, always, um, try to randomize the regular stuff, meaning lifespan, uh, mass, um, speed. Those things need to have, each particle should have their own value, slightly different from the other. Otherwise, it will look very repetitive and boring. And that's what's happening right now. All the particles have a lifespan of one. And because he's moving around left to right, up and down, then doesn't, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. But if this was a plane emitting particles straight up or down, then you get a straight line at the bottom or at the top. You will see exactly where they die. So that kind of sucks, but that's the way it works. It's a constant value. And it will have, it's useful, and it will be useful when we start talking about other things. Right now, I'm just saying, it's probably good to randomize it. How do you randomize it? The next one, random range. So random range takes a value of lifespan, okay? And it adds and subtracts this attribute right here, lifespan random. So if I say a lifespan of one, well, let's say a lifespan of two, with a lifespan random of one, <coughs> excuse me, it means that these particles will have a, a lifespan in between one and three. So it takes two and it subtracts one, and that's your minimum value. And it will add one, and it'll be your maximum value. So Particles will live between one and three seconds. So it starts to look different and nicer. And the last one is lifespan PP only. The double P stands for per particle. So that will mean when you want to use expressions. And it sounds, uh, it might sound scary to some of you, the, 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 well, those of you who are brand new to these courses. Those of you who have taken the courses, you know that that's just nothing. Just, uh, it's easy, it's a walk in the park. And it's useful, it's quite useful, and you know, actually that's the most common thing to do, is to set it to lifespan PP and control it with an expression or something else. It doesn't have to be only an expression. You will see later that you can use textures and ramps and many other things. Um, but basically each particle will have a control uh, of their own life based on something else. But for something as simple as what we did right here, then uh, random, you can see here, you know, the, the, the reason why it's good to have a random lifespan, you can, there's no straight lines. You, well, a lot of this particle distribution comes from the field that I'm going to be using, the particle field. But basically, um, it's always good to have different lifespan to get, you know, ra jaggedy edges and things like that. So perfect. So how do we go from this to something cool like this? Simple. Um, but let me see what else on the particles. So the particles, uh, like I said, speed is already talked about. Lifespan is very important. The start frame, you know, you know, you know now you know what you can do. Some effects don't start on frame until frame 200, so there's no point of having particles earlier, I think. So keep an eye on that. Just make sure when is the right time for your effect to begin, and that's what you're going to be setting here. They also have an attribute called conserve, and we're going to talk about it in a second. And we'll go, you know, we'll play by ear as we go along. But for, for now, this is enough. So perfect. These particles lack, obviously. Well, there, there's not enough of them. Sorry, let's get back. There's not enough of them, and there's nothing right now with color. That's what we're going to go. Let's go forward. I'm going to open the next scene, which is basically a cleaner version of this. 
So basic, I, I misspelled the mission with double team. It was too late last night. All right, so here we go. He's just giving you the rear. It's basically this image that you can see is basically an angle of him doing something like that, probably. Kind of like that. So let's get to that point. To get to here, we need to get particles uh, to have color and to move around a little bit, of course, in an interesting way. So now we know the particles, uh, particle emitters, they just push particles away. And yes, you can randomize a little bit the speed. There is a, an attribute called speed random, which just like the lifespan will add and subtract to each particle a little bit of speed. But it's not exactly what I need um, to get something interesting like that shape. So we're going to have to move particles with fields. And fields are right here. That's just another difference from Maya 2013 to this one, just the position of the fields. Now they combine fields and constraints and everything into one big list. But it's all the same. They're all right here. Just like in Maya 2013. Um, so fields are forces. Forces that you will push particles and have them move uh, based on the criteria and the behavior of each particular one. The names tend to be very descriptive, which is cool. Um, but we'll learn how to use them, you know, by, by using them, by playing with them. So I'm gonna get rid of uh, the, I'm gonna get rid of all of this and that as well. Okay, and that, all I, all I have here is just my little guy doing his thing in a cleaner environment. No, not so many nodes left over from back in the day. It's just basically him. You can move him around and place him whatever you want with his animation. All right, so let's go ahead and now speed up and recreate what we wanted. So select them and particles. When I'm going to be using end particles, remember these are regular particles. Later, we'll talk about them. Emit from object, surface, create. Done. We get our emitter. We're going to bump up the rate from 100 particles a second to 1,000. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need to get used my voice to recording again, man. Uh, this is very taxing. <laughs> it's amazing how you, you know, I'm not yelling, but it's crazy how the voice gets strained. Uh, so anyway, so a thousand particles a second. Uh, they have already an attribute of speed, which is fine. I don't mind. My particles, they're going. They're not going to live forever because I don't. I don't want that. I don't want a long, a long trail of particles going all the way to here. So my particles are going to live randomly between let's say let's say I don't know I'm gonna leave it at one and I'm gonna give them a random range I don't know 0.5 so they live between 0.5 and one and a half seconds um, aside of that let's just leave it as it is and see what that looks like also my scene file begins on frame 20 you can see so We'll change that to start frame to frame 20. Hit rewind always and hit play. The easiest way to see your particles is to um, go into wireframe. That's what I do here. And here they are. There we go. You can see with my display. <coughs> It's a 3.4 seconds, you know, frames a second. You can always check over here. My max playback speed is set to free. I'm gonna play every frame. It's a little bit slow because, yes, yeah, this guy probably has some history on it and he has the joints already there. Um, there are ways to speed him up. I'll show you later, but for now, what you're gonna be doing is very simple. So don't, I don't wanna, you know, get you confused with new information. But there we go. So a thousand particles, is, it's not the particles. What I'm trying to say, it's not the particles what makes the scene slower than you will expect. It's just the history that the geometry has, the deformation. Um, so I'll probably upload two scene files. One that is lower than the other, you can see the difference. And I'll talk about it later, why it's why is lower. For now, I'm gonna take the 1,000, I think I want more. I'm gonna probably put it to 5,000 a second. Always rewind, okay? 
And hit play, there we go, 5,000 particles a second. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so let's put them in a post like that. And why not, let's go ahead and hit render and see what happens. Um, if you hit render right away, Maya by default nowadays, I think is using Arnold as a render. The new Arnold render, which is right here. I'm not gonna get mixed up to that, man. That's uh, someone else's problem. Not for now. I'm not gonna talk about Arnold because some studios don't use Arnold, some others, others do. That's a new thing in Maya 2017, and don't worry about it. All I want to test with you guys is particles. We're gonna talk about particles, not about anything else. So Maya hardware is the best way to go. Um, you can try Maya software, but this, this is gonna happen. You're gonna hit render, and you're gonna see black. And you can go and look at the alpha channel, which is this, the transparency, and there's nothing. Mm -hmm. How come? Nothing, right? It's because Maya particles, okay, the points, are not being rendered by Maya software. Okay, so you select your particles and you go again to the channel box. Okay, there's a long list of things that we're going to be talking one at a time, at the proper time. But one of them is the particle render type, which is right here. Right now it's set to points. You could switch this to multi points. And again, we'll discuss them later. Multi streaks, numeric, okay, spheres. Okay, if you switch them to spheres and you hit render with Maya software. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Okay, so like the particles again. Sorry, particle render type spheres. Uh, then you get streaks again. Then you get blobby surfaces. And he has an SW. Cloud has an SW and tube. SW means that is a Maya software render. will do you know will render this. So if you switch it to that and then again hit render. Voila, then you get something. That's the alpha channel. That's the color. So most of the time, you know, most of the particles are not being rendered by Maya software. I'm not gonna get into this discussion right now of why that looks blue or anything. Don't worry about it. I want to render points at the moment. And points, like I said, don't come out through, but they come through Maya hardware. So let's hit render. And there they are. So stay on Maya hardware for now. It's very quick, it will use your video card, and it's very reliable, and it's nice. For testing, it's perfect. That's how I did the, the renders that you see here. Okay, so perfect, at least the points come through. So we're far away from this, but we're getting there. We get the shape. Next thing, we need to give the particles some color. How do we color them in order to get to this kind of variations. So many different colors right here. And there, and there, and there. And it's simpler than you think. Maybe some kind of mad genius, but not genius. But someone that is inclined to programming will come up with a script and will just color them with an expression. But that's boring, man. What you want to do is open your web browser. Yes, your web browser. And you're going to go into your good friend Google. And you're going to find, let's look for whatever. Let's look for fire. And you're going to find images. And there they are. Pick whatever you like. I already selected some. Um, pick anything. Something interesting. Think of it that the particles will extract the, inform the color information from their picture, and they will take each one of them will take a color. So in a case like this, you know, then you get particles that are this tones of blue plus this tones of you know all mixed together. This is uh, this is an interesting one, which you already selected it. Uh, but there you go, you got many things. That's for fire. You can also, the, the, the best selling one is Galaxy. Because look at all the different colors you have. 
and from that point forward, go go or go around and look and look and look for the cool stuff. I don't know uh, explosions. Then you get different colors as well. Okay, this is interesting. Try to get as uh, bigger the resolution that you can of a picture. Because remember, there's, there's a little points that are going to be you know picking colors from all this thing. So this is a quite nice image. In fact, why don't we get it? Let's just get it. Let's just view the image. Here it is. Right click on it. I'm going to save it into my image folder for my project. So documents, Maya, projects. This is my effects masters. And I'm going to uh, save it into my, it should be into my source images folder. And I save it right there. Okay, so how do we get that image into those particles? So here's my little guy. Uh, and it's just for visual effect, what I'm going to do right now. This is not a step that is necessary for you to get this uh, color into the particles, but let's go ahead and do it. I just want to, I just, I think it's a good practice for later on. You, you will thank me later. I'm going to go into my rendering editor and I'm going to open my hypershade. Remember, if you're lost in this interface, Refer to the intro to Maya uh, for Dynamics and learn about it from Igor. So here we go. This opens the hypershade. It might look daunting to some of you, but don't worry about it. It's very simple. What I need to do is this, uh, I'm going to assign a new material to this little guy. Any material, the simpler the better. So I'm going to choose a Lambert. So which is Lambert 20. I'm going to middle mouse drag it onto him. And now my little guy is using that, uh, that uh, material. In that material, I'm going to map into the color channel. I'm going to map a file. Don't look at this. This is, for me, it's a little, well, it looks kind of scary, but nothing. It's the same thing as before. Just fancier nodes and whatever. Don't worry. You pick a file. Basically, what you need to do is just uh, select the new picture, which is right here, into the color. You don't see it yet because you're not displaying textures. So once you display textures, it looks like this. And those with, those of you with experience in texturing and all that, well, but those UVs are all messed up. Are you crazy? Why are you using that? Don't worry. You're not going to render him. And you can UV him anytime, anytime you want. Uh, be my guest. Do whatever you want with him to have a better set of UVs. Or, uh, I'm not a modeler or anything like that. So for me, I don't care. I'll do an automatic mapping. It will look like that. You can do whatever you want. All I care is that he shows you that that image is mapped onto him. That doesn't mean that if I rewind and hit play, I'm going to get particles with that color. Of course not. You can see that they're still gray. Like I said, this step is it's not really necessary for to achieve particle color. But I just I think it's a good idea visually to represent what it's coming from. Because the particles, yes, once I activate the feature, they will read, you know, the color on the point where they're born of the surface and assume that color. So that's why it's always a good idea to have it visible. So here it is. It kind of looks like a cheap version of Iron Man. <laughs> or the color, I think. I don't know. The yellow and the red. So yeah. There we go. So I'm going to grab the, 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 the responsible for that um, assignment of color is going to be the emitter. So I'm going to go to my emitter, and this cannot be done on the channel box. It has to be done in the attribute editor. And you scroll all the way to the bottom, all the way down, and then here you have texture emission attributes. And you have a texture rate, and you have a particle color. There we go, my good friend color. So perfect. What you can see here is that it says inherit color from the emitter, right? We're on the emitter. So if you're going to inherit the color, that's what you want. You want, remember, the surface is the emitter. The surface um, uh, will, um, the particle will be born on that point on the surface. It will look at the color that it has and it will take it. So let's activate inherit color. But which color, right? You need to apply the texture. So for that, you need to go and open the file and look for your image. Perfect. You can also use an image sequence. 
And I'll leave that up to you to experiment later, other ideas. So you can have an animated fire, for example. So that interesting as well. So here we go. So let's rewind and hit play. And aha, nothing. But how come? You will say, how come? If I did what you told me, it's inherent in color and is that it's just simple because the particles, yes, they do inherit the color, but they don't have a way to show it to you. That's just things that that's just the way Maya works. Steps that you need to follow. Uh, you need to have that attribute be added to the particle. Maya just simplifies the list of information or the attributes that particles carry with them in the sake of keeping everything smaller and faster. And you'll be adding attributes as you need. So color is not really needed for the particle to exist and move. But in my case, I do need it. So how do I add color? No worries. You go to the particle shape. So select your particle, go to the shape node, and then you go onto the... Because each particle will have a color, so they will have to be a color attribute per particle. So always look at per particle attributes right here. And then you can see the color is not on the list. These are the basic things the particle needs to live and move. And then you will need to add more. But then you have color right here. So if you hit on this button, then you get the option of adding a per object attribute or a per particle attribute. Now, if you wanted all the particles to be red or green or blue or whatever, all of them being the same color, then you can add a per object. So all of them will be the same. But what you want in this case is that every particle to be different and have a, an ability to select each, its own color based on what we said already. So I'm going to add a per particle attribute and I'm going to add it. And there we go. So now you can see that on my list it shows up RGB double P. So red, green, and blue, typical, per particle. And nothing is there. Don't worry about it. You hit rewind. You hit play. Let me just uh, pause this thing for a second. And there we go. Particle color. Particle color that matches what's happening on here. That's why it's a good idea to have the, the texture map to the to the character. So here we go. It matches. Now I can hide him. I'm not really hiding him. I'm not displaying him. It's a different thing. One thing is hiding the object by selecting it and hiding it. Control H. And another one is not telling Maya not to display it on my viewport. The two different concepts. Um, you're just saying that because if you hide the geometry, it might not be the same thing. But right now, I'm not, I don't want to see him. I just want to see what ha what's happening in here. And you can see it's a lot faster. Playback. You went from 3 or 4 frames a second to 14. There we go. So let's try it. Let's just get him into this position. Let's just get him a little bit closer. Remember, Maya hardware. And hit render. And there are my points with color. That's a good way to go. We're a lot closer to something like this or like that. What's the difference here? Well, you know, we need a lot more points. Let's go ahead and do that. Select my emitter and crank it up to, I don't know, let's say 20,000 particles a second. Here we go. Perfect. Don't worry about the motion. They're not moving very, you know, very nicely. They're just pretty much being born and move away. But they exist. And they have color. I don't like the amount. I need more. Let's just say 60,000. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Let's pause it. Let's render it again. It takes obviously it takes a little bit longer, and there we go. Cool, I like it. All right, now what we need to do is just come up with ways of um, having these particles not to have this boring shape. You can read his body really easily, and like I said, remember I want you guys to give me for an assignment just shapes, and nice colors, and shapes. Use my character or don't use it. Doesn't doesn't work. No, no, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but you know, find cool ways to uh, to display these particles. 
So let's see. Let me just render this angle. Exactly. But you can still read, you know, a very, uh, you know, round head. And you can you can still read the body, and that's not really what I want. That's not. Where is it? Oh, I didn't save it. The cool one. But anyway, the one that it was in this angle. But anyway, I just don't want to see these kind of shapes. So how do we break that up? And that that's coming from the fact that the 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 emitter has a you know has a round head and it has a normal speed set to one, um, and nothing else. There's no variation. So that's that's we don't want that. We want to break it up. So let's break it up. Let's introduce the first field of this course. So like I said, fields are forces. They're going to be moving these particles around. Um, and be before I do. Let me just talk about one more attribute of these particles. If I select them, remember what I told you when we when we first put particles on the scene with the Omni emitter, and I said that that was just like working in outer space, because the particles move into infinity and they, they were never losing their momentum. There was no friction, no gravity. Right. So the particles have an attribute here called conserve, and the conserve is just that: it's a conserve momentum. If you leave it at one, then it means that the particles will never lose their energy. Let me just uh, move a little bit my chair. Uh, they will never lose energy. They will continue to move and they will be the same. That's not really uh, nice. and That's not really ideal for what I'm doing. I want them to be able to lose a little bit of energy. And that's going to be a random value as well. And it's very sensitive. Meaning that if I put 0.98 instead of 1, they will be losing energy already. If you go too far, they will just be born and don't move anymore. So that's not what you want. You want a little bit of variation. That will add a little bit of variation uh, at the moment, but not enough. But once you start introducing forces, yes, you will definitely see uh, cool stuff. You can see now what I'm talking about, the shapes. So this could be something else once we break it with a, with a force. That's what I want to see, shapes and forms and colors for the assignment. So perfect. Now that we have set the conserve to 0.98, that's something you should probably do in every scene, unless there's specific there's specific need for it. But almost never, you know, you do that. So every time you create a particle system, then you go ahead and change the lifespan and uh, change the conserve right away. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, for the for the field to be connected to the particles right away is easier if you select the particles. With the particles selected, then you go back to the effects menu. Then you go to the field menu, and let's create first a turbulence. That's the one that we always use. <clears throat> I don't want. Okay, there you go. So it's my turbulence field, and right now, if he, you know, by default, he has a uh, a lot of these attributes, and it's very simple. Like again, don't let yourself be scared by by looking at all these long lists. Don't worry about it. It's easier than you think. With fields, the main thing uh, is the magnitude. And that's almost the same as the emitter's rate. is the amount of force that it's going to be outputting. This little guy is located right there. At the center. If I show my grid, it's going to be at the center. And it's a little point. Meaning that it's almost like an omni emitter. It's almost like a point light. That force will come up. Okay, from that point out, um, based on the magnitude that you have right here. The units of the magnitude, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, in all these years, I don't know what, what the units are. But it's just the number. The bigger the number, the stronger it is. Um, and it's, it's coming from this point. But let's say that you won't want that. Let's say right now if I hit, if I hit play, rewind and play, then I don't want to see much of a difference. And this looks cool. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, but I don't see much of a difference. I still see the round face. I'm going to go ahead and, and amplify that from 5 to 50. And I do see a little difference. But I still see the round head, man. And the reason is because the force is from this point out. And, and it's getting weaker as you get further away from it. And it's, well, how do I know that? Because this attribute here called attenuation is responsible for weakening your force field 
as you get further away from it. Um, so it means that this field is contained into an area, which I don't like. In this case, you don't want that. You want this turbulence to be everywhere. And the way to make this thing uh, function everywhere in your scene is just by taking the attenuation and setting that to zero. Look at the difference now. And I'm not going to rewind because you want, you want you to see how you, some guy is going to break this shape. So I'm going to hit continue. There we go. It evaporates or dissipates or whatever. So now you can see that the turbulence field is working everywhere. And now we start breaking the shapes. It doesn't look like a little alien anymore. If I hit render, you can see how simple it is with Maya hardware. There's no, no, uh, how do you call it? People say cake and watermelon. There's no, there's no bullshit. You just hit render and it renders. And it looks, you know, you can see the color, you can see the particle size, everything. So here we go. Particle distribution with color variations very quickly. Very, very quickly. So I want you to try. I remember many, many shapes. Be creative. You know, try many things. Be funny. Be whatever you want. Okay, perfect. So the, the turbulent field is working, but it's working too much. So, you know, probably for, for the example, right? Well, it's giving me something more like noise than anything. But I wanted just to prove my point with the attenuation thing. So I'm going to take the magnitude to something more manageable, like 15. Rewind and hit play. On the example that I showed you, right, on the pictures that I have here, sorry, the pictures that I have here, it's kind of, the particles are kind of going back, like towards the back, like being blown by air. So, you know, it's kind of fighting like a storm or something. Well, if you want, you know, if you want to get that kind of direction, right, then we're missing something that pushes the particles in that direction over there. Um, so that's simple. Keep rendering, you know, as much as possible. Um, one thing we should talk right now is just the render settings. Because there's, there's a few settings, not many for the Maya hardware, but um, it renders right away. But there's a few settings because you can see that this one has motion blur. You can see that the, the particles have a little bit of a line that it kind of takes the motion away. You know, you can kind of read the movement of the particles. Um, so it does have options. So if you hit on this little guy right here, which is the same as this one, it takes you to the Maya hardware options or render settings. Here you can pick your resolution. Um, I know you're going to ask me well, what kind of format the, the, the assignment has to be. Don't be so formal with the assignments. Be casual. Do, it, do what you want, do what you feel like. If you feel like doing a video, do a video. If you feel like doing a play blast, do a play blast. If you want to do frames, do them. Whatever you want, whatever you think looks best. In any resolution, I don't, I don't care for that. Just make it look cool. Uh, here you can pick the, the render camera. Again, this is something that you should be covering in Maya intro, not in this class. I'm just going to quickly go over it. The camera you're going to be rendering, your resolution, and my render settings. So you have presets right now. You can get a preview quality render. So it changes some things for you. You can hit render, and it should be very quick. There we go. It takes, uh, what, 0 0.02 sec you know, minutes or two seconds to render. And it looks like that. And you can be, you know, you can up the quality, for example, to production. And it will take a little bit longer. It took three seconds. And it looks a little bit different. So you play with this. We'll talk about it a bit later. Right now, let's just push these particles back a little bit. So select the particles. And again, go to fields. And let's create, for example, a uniform field. Like the name tells you, the uniform field, which is right here, it will push particles in a straight line, in a direction that you tell it to based on a vector. So it's almost like the directional limiter that we saw earlier. The same thing. You pick your field, you have a magnitude as well. You also have an attenuation that is in every field. And you have at the bottom direction x, y, and z. So x, y, and z. That's, that's what it's going to be pushing. Um, remember, if you leave the attenuation to 1, this guy is going to only function 
in that particular point and going to get weaker. You don't want that. You want this to be a, a continuous air, you know, force of air everywhere in your scene. So I'm going to take the attenuation, set it to zero. Hit rewind. Let me just uh, move away. Let me hit play. Let me just, I kind of got lost in this scene. One sec. There we go. So right now, the uniform field is pushing in the x direction. And if you can see right here, x is pushing that direction, so towards the right of the screen. So if I hit play, you will see the particles. They kind of tend to go to that side. You can always amplify it to see if it's true. Let's just try 25. And there they go. That's x. Many ideas will come your way, I'm sure. So here's a poor little guy being blown in the wrong direction by air. But it works. It does something. Then you need to start balancing your forces. And if the air is too strong and you want something that blows in this direction, but with more turbulence, then go ahead and bump it up. Set it to 25. Then you can start getting a mix. This reminded me of a shot in the day the earth stood still when, when the Keanu Reeves guy just touches the sphere at the end and he kind of vanishes away. That's pretty much what we did. You know, blew him away with particles in that direction. So there we go. So, But that's not the direction I want. I want the particles to be blown actually towards the back of the screen in the Z axis, but the negative Z axis. So I'm going to grab him here and I'm going to set the X to zero. And I'm sorry, and the direction in Z to negative one. There we go. Hit play. And now the air is blowing back. I'm gonna bring him back just probably to so it's easier for you to see what's happening. And there it is. So perfect. Now it's just a matter of balancing. And this is always the way it works, is a balancing act between the number of particles, the strength of each field, many other attributes. So play with this. Play with this in your spare time. I don't want to get too you know, much deeper into this lesson. I want you to leave you with this, but I'm obviously I'm not done right away. I'm just going to put this back to probably 10. My turbulence, I'm going to be putting it back to I don't know, 15. Hit rewind, hit play. I'm going to hide him again. Now you know what's happening, just to make everything faster. Cool. Let's go ahead and render. All right, so here we have a, a cool shape. A good color, and we have, you know, variation. You can start seeing this to work. So, perfect. You can play with all the forces if you want, but for now, I think it's, uh, it's good. And once you have this set up, okay, my advice is obviously to save it. So this is the, let me just save the scene as, let me say, spell this correctly, basic emission class. This is a Maya student version, that's what always going to give you this. Done. And I, I mean to say because you're set up to create many different variations of this as far as color goes. What do I mean by that? Well, then you can grab the emitter, you go to the attributes, and all you need to do is change this image and get a different look. Let's, let's do it. Let's grab another one, which I saved it in the wrong place, but it's fine, the images. I get this guy, for example. And there we go. Different colors, very interesting stuff. It renders like that. You see, it doesn't even look like an alien anymore. It just looks like groups of particles of different colors. And then if you haven't seen the alien, then you don't know what it is. But getting this going, this kind of particle distribution with this kind of color is very tricky all the way. You see what I mean? So it starts to work. Let's try another one. You see how fast it is now. Now that you have everything set up, it's very quick. This one is similar to the one you tried, but let's go ahead and try it. 
All right. Uh, if you hit uh, this button right here, it will save the image, the render that you have. So you can compare with the previous one. Okay, so you get that, or this. Cool. Let's try, let's see what this is the same. I haven't tried this one yesterday. Let's try this one. Of course, there's a lot, there's black in the picture. If there's black, you're going to get black particles, right? Because they're inherent the color. So you will see them, this, you will have them visible in the screen here on the Maya, you know, viewport. When you render, let me show you. You will think that they're not there, or, you know, but the, you know there are. It's just the black particles on top of the black background. This button is the alpha channel, and you can see the particles have no transparency. We'll deal with that later. We'll talk about it later, but for now, I think it's just fine. Can you see, you get different colors and different angles. We'll give you different particle shapes. If you have a character of your own, if you have another shape or static shapes, go ahead and experiment. Do whatever you want. And those of you who have taken the previous course, the 2013 version, and you already know how to do soft bodies and you're already, you know, advancing this thing, go ahead. Go crazy. Do whatever you want. Don't worry about it. There's not going to disrupt the flow of the course. So try. Try many things. So perfect. And so there we go. So this is a very quick way for you to try different particle looks. This is obviously one of the coolest ones because of the color that you get. Look at all the different variations. Excellent. You can also try it in a static plane. And, and you know, just you will see pretty much a a uh, replicate of your picture made of uh, particles. So I'm going to save this scene. You already see, you got you got the point with this. So I'm going to rewind this and save it. And just quickly show you what I mean. And now you will see how quick the whole process you can be, you know, you can be if you don't explain step by step. So I'm going to create a polyplane. Make it big. Emit particles from that. Surface, create. I'm going to grab the emitter and I'm going to give it no speed. I want the particles to stay on the surface. And I want a lot of them. I'm going to set it to 10,000. I'm also going to map. I'm going to inherit color. I'm going to map a file. I'm going to pick. Let's begin with this one. Excellent. I'm not going to show the polygon plane. I'm going to grab my particles and make sure they have RGB PP, which is right here. Fantastic. And hit play. You can see. Obviously, the closer you get, the more particles you will need. But the further away you are, this could easily be a plane with a picture mapped on it. But it's not. They're particles. And now that you're all set, then you can quickly change it let's just give us a bit more time the more you put the you know the more particles you let be around then the closer to the picture it will get but you get the idea and then from this point you can apply forces and things like that We'll get deeper into that concept later. So I think with that is a good point to stop. I'm very happy to have finished this first lesson. I think with a, it's a good start. It's going to be fine. I will see you soon. I'm not going to tell you exactly when. You know, I'm going to try to do this. I cannot do it daily because I also have to record these things in Spanish. So give me a couple of days or three days. Play with this. You're going to have plenty of time to, to prepare for my next lesson. So uh, thank you very much. Enjoy it. Practice, play, be creative, share it. Um, wafer and system emails and all that from Vimeo, from myself, or the location of the uh, support group on Facebook. Uh, we'll come, up, come along with a decision together about when we're going to meet on the live classroom to talk about these things. And uh, we'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you very, very much. See you soon.